Yeah. Very nice. Same so. place for some new job. Good job. Congratulations. That's a warm fuzzy pipe. Right. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Kevin got his job at um, Guest Home Estates. Oh, yay. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. He'll be we'll starting that tomorrow. Yeah. All right, gotcha. Very nice. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm just thankful for all these cats. Yes. It's just wonderful. Wonderful, isn't it? Again, I'm so nervous. I don't know how to ask all these people here. <laughs> <laughs> it is a blessing, that's for sure. So, no doubt about it. In fact, we got a lot of Wickham people in here. Yes? I'm ready for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you wake up people. What I want to mention is this. Does anything look familiar? How about the carpet? <laughs> How about the chairs? Yeah, no doubt, right? So Wickham stole the chair idea from us. But we stole the carpet idea from them. <laughs> so it's like a mini Wickham over here, all right, folks? So anyway, I just wanted to point that out to you. All right, any other praises, anybody? I praise God that carpet's cooking and they have a really hot dogs. Yeah. Somebody cook. else is cooking. It's a great cook. I'm praising God that you're cleaning. Ah. Oh, no. All right. So that's not happening. <laughs> so, it might happen, though. It might happen. You never know. So I'm trying to palm it off. All right. How about, all right. Another thing we like to do is publicly announce prayer requests. Do we have anybody that has a prayer request they'd like? Yes, ma'am. I did have a prayer request. A uh, young lady by the name of Kirsten she was married in June and her husband passed away just this week. So wow. she's, she was married in June? She's a widow and three months. And her husband, husband just passed away? Yeah. She's 22 years old. So oh, she's like goodness. Years old. Yes, okay. Is she a believer? Oh, yes. All right, good. <coughs> What's that? Wait, no. Um, Um, okay, gotcha. So, wow, that's such a sad thing. We'll definitely yes. yes, sir. Let's focus. Okay. Mm -hmm. Our brand. Jesus, and we're going to talk about this whole living your way situation, Father. 
So I ask, Father, that you send that Holy Spirit in right now. Penetrate our hearts to open our minds and open our, our ears and open our hearts to accept what it is that you have for us. Heavenly Father, please, you have completely provided for us here in Chanute, America, every waking moment of your life. Please help us remember, Father, that we want for nothing, that we are spoiled, that you have given us provision upon provisions. And there are people out there who have nothing. Please help us remember, folks, Father, that we are those people to help them. That's why we are here. Father, we have many people we want to lift up to you and petition. We have Judy in this heartbreaking story of this young lady who's lost her husband. Father, we just lift her up right now, knowing that your will will be done. Please be with her. Please bring that comfort and peace to her. Only you can fix this situation, Father. So we, we pray for her in your son's name. We have Ron, who has an unspoken request. We have Jim, who has a friend who's going through some cancer issues. Father, we just lift these people up to you, knowing full well that your will will be done. We ask, Father, for peace and comfort for these people, so they understand it's going to go the way you say it's going to go, Father. And if it's a healing situation, you'll heal it. If it's a spiritual healing situation, you will take care of it, because you are faithful, Father. You do what you say you are going to do. And then this family, Father, that went through the fire that Chet mentioned. Oh my goodness, Father. Whatever it is you need us to be doing with that situation, please let it be known to our hearts. Whatever it is you want us to be doing, please, Father, just let us know so we can have some kind of impact if needed. If not, please, Father, we just ask that you be with them at this difficult time for them. It's got to be so difficult. Carla's going through her health issues. We just lift her up once again, Father. We just give it to you. We just give it to you. As she starts this new job, we just pray that her health is going to be cooperating in this whole situation. And then finally, Father, let us pray for your people in Israel. We are following this closely, Father. We know it's connected to the end times. There's no doubt about what's going on here, Father. And we just pray for that whole situation, both sides, Father. Not only Israel, but Palestine. Whatever it takes, Father, to honor you, let's, whatever it is we need to be doing with that, Father, please let us know. Because this is going to go again the way you say it's going to go, Father. And please, just let us be involved however way you wish. And finally, Father, I just want to end our prayer today giving you all the praise and glory and thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ. We have redemption, Father. We have been saved by His blood that He suffered through to give us Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us with compassion and mercy and being faithful. For always doing what you say you're going to do. Help us, Father, do what we say we're going to do. It's in your Son's holy name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right, at this time, people, we meet and greet each other again. So now I'm not going to talk. I'm like super happy to see all these faces. I'm also super anxious to see all these faces.
brought a woman <laughs> caught in the act of adultery. And after placing her in the center of the courtyard, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say, Jesus? I'm just, sorry, trying to grab that picture in my hand here. What then do you say? Now they were saying this because they wanted to test him so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. Can you picture that? When they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is out without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again he stooped down and he started writing on the ground again with his finger, didn't he? Now when they heard this, they began leaving one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the courtyard. And straightening up, Jesus Christ said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she responds with this, No one, Lord. And Jesus said right back, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, do not sin any longer. Let me pray for the message today, folks. Let's go to the Lord for Heavenly Father, I come to you on my knees. Humbly submitting to your word. Father, I ask that you invade this message with your intent. Please, Father, provide us with your wisdom and your revelation. Please, Father, help us with an open heart so we can understand what you want us to take out the doors. Father, your word is truth, and truth needs to be proclaimed out loud today. It is my intent to say your truth, Father. And if it is not truthful, please, Father, please correct in whatever way needs to be corrected. Because all that matters is your truth. In your son's holy name we pray. So here we see a striking picture of Jesus doing something that sets him apart from everybody else around him. The reason he does this is because he is like and he is unlike anybody else that's around him, I should say. Now in the previous chapter, chapter 7, Jesus had a confrontation with the Pharisees and chief priests while he was speaking to a crowd. They, at that time, wanted to arrest him, accusing him of stirring up trouble. But that encounter ended without an arrest. In fact, we read how it concluded. In verse 53, it says, And everybody just went home. Well, that is everybody except Jesus Christ. Because the next verse, in John chapter 8, 1, it tells us that instead of going home, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now in your brochure, you'll notice on the inside at the top, I put a picture of the Mount of Olives. That's actually the Mount of Olives. So apparently he went somewhere in that area there. The Mount of Olives is a significant place, spiritually speaking that is. And by that, it simply means this. It has spiritual meaning. It has spiritual ramifications. In the Old Testament, in Zechariah chapter 14, we see that one day there is someone coming to the Mount of Olives to go to war. To go to war against darkness. Let me read it to you. Zechariah 14, 3 and 4. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when He fights on the day of battle. On that day His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is the front of Jerusalem to the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west, forming a very large valley. Half of the mountain will move toward the north, and the other half toward the south. That person who is coming to wage war that we just read of in Zechariah is the same person that we read of today in John's passage. In addition to this, we all know that Jesus Christ died, right? We know that He died and rose after the third day. We all know that, right? We also know that He eventually ascended to heaven, right? Where was His launching point to go back to see the Father? It was the Mount of Olives. Let me read it to you in Acts chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you to heaven, he will come in the same way as 
you have watched him go up into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mountain called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. The Mount of Olives is a monumental place in the plans of God. Whenever you read of things happening at or near the mountain of olives, it is very wise to pay attention. Our story today starts at this unique place called the Mount of Olives. And it's a story that paints an exact picture of exactly who this unique man is, Jesus of Nazareth. We read in verses 1 and 2, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning He came again into the temple area, and all the people were coming to Him. And He sat down and began teaching. Question, and I do this a lot, friends. I have a question. Who is all the people? Who is that? I mean, is He talking about all of Israel? Is that who all the people is? How about this? Is it all the people in Jerusalem? Is that who all the people are? Probably not, right? Because the temple area can't hold the entire city of Jerusalem. Who is all the people? It is a great question, folks. And it's a question that is very relevant to you and I. Because whenever you see in Scripture that Jesus is teaching or revealing something, and along with His teaching and revealing are words like, to all the people, we should perk up immediately. Because his audience, it is not just the people standing in front of him. It's the whole world. The audience is the whole world. It is all the people. It is you. It is me. It is everyone. Folks, it is everyone. So what is it that he was going to teach this day at the Mount of Olives? What is it, guys? Well, guess what? We don't know, do we? Why don't we know? Because it doesn't say. We don't know because we learn something happens. What happens is he gets interrupted, doesn't he? Something happens to him. How was he interrupted? He was interrupted by the religious elite of the day. The leadership decided to get into his business, didn't they? Those Pharisees and scribes decided to go at Jesus once again, I guess the day before was not enough. These guys certainly did not have a correct understanding of who Jesus was. They were constantly fighting Him. We see they were not interested in what Jesus was teaching and revealing that day because they were not interested in anything of God, were they? What they were interested in doing was confronting Jesus. Why? What was their ulterior motive to do this? You can see that in the next verse. It says in verse 3, they wanted to confront Jesus with a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. They wanted to do this so they could try and trap him into doing something that would expose him, right? Yeah. Now I have mentioned it many times in the past for you regular people here. Whenever you see a woman be the focus of a passage in Scripture, the story is going to be a wonderful story of teaching about redemption. We're going to see that play out here today as well. Now I want to give you a quick review of who these scribes and Pharisees are. The scribes were the best interpreters of the Bible at that time. They understood the content of Scripture. They knew how to interpret the Bible. Now don't forget, the Bible back then was the Tanakh. It was just the Old Testament. No New Testament around here. These Pharisees, they were also experts, but they weren't experts in the Bible so much. They were experts in Jewish law. They were experts not in the written Word of God, but they were, they were experts in the written Jewish law that coincides with the written Word of God. These two groups of people, they did not necessarily get along with each other. They were competing factions. But this day, at the Mount of Olives, they kind of banded together, didn't they? They banded together to go at Jesus for a shared purpose. We're going to talk about that purpose today. 
Now we see in verse 4, these leaders confront Jesus with the adulterous woman by calling him teacher. Do you hear the sarcasm in that statement? Teacher, teacher, teacher. Do you get what's going on here, friends? These leaders despised Jesus, yet they were sarcastically calling him teacher as a way to kind of mock him, right? They? They're like, you're a teacher? Really? Because their whole goal in life at that time was to discredit the Christ. These leaders were not at all interested in, that spirit, in the spiritual condition of that woman. That has nothing to do with what's going on here today. They were out to get Jesus in front of all the people. We know this is the motive because look deeply at verse 4. It says, the woman has been caught. If a woman is caught in adultery, then you have to know, friends, that a man was caught as well, right? right. There wasn't no one thing going on here, was there? Both of them were caught. And by God's Word, if you study His Word, you know, you realize, you understand that both of these people should have been brought in front of Jesus, not just the woman. If the trial was really a trial, if this was going to be a justice thing, both of them should have been there. But these leaders, they're not concerned with justice at all about God's law, are they? They're concerned with their own agenda. They were picking and choosing God's law in order to serve themselves so they could discredit and humiliate Jesus as a teacher. This is what I did. Hmm. Sounds like today, doesn't it? Picking and choosing what you're going to do with God's Word so it meets your own agenda. Sounds like today, doesn't it? In verse 5, we see the leader say, Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say, Jesus? I just, I can hear the sarcasm, right? This statement by the leaders about Moses commanding something, it is only partially true. The law of God states that all guilty parties can be stoned, not just the woman. These leaders are disingenuous. They are conniving, and they think they can outmaneuver the Christ. Consider, friends, for a moment, what they're doing here. Just consider this. They are thinking they can trap Jesus into saying something, teaching something that is against God's written word. Isn't that silly when you think about it? It is silly. Jesus, the Messiah, doing something or saying something that is in opposition to what He wrote when He was on Mount Sinai? Was Jesus Christ on Mount Sinai? Folks, you all will proclaim, or at least a lot of us will proclaim, that Jesus Christ has always been. There's never been a time when Jesus Christ wasn't. If that is true, He was there at the beginning in the creation, wasn't He? If that is true, He was there on Mount Sinai with God as they were handing down the law. If it's true, a lot of you are shaking your heads up and down, so you're agreeing with me, right? Those leaders, those Pharisees and scribes absolutely had no clue who they were dealing with. They were testing Him, which turns out to be an exercise in futility, doesn't it? You cannot fight God. And we see in verse 6 that this is the case. Now they were saying this to test him so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus did something. He stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. Y'all can picture that, right? It is so easy to see what is happening here, isn't it? They were looking for a way to accuse him. They were not interested in God's way. They were not interested in true justice for anyone. They were interested in themselves. But look at the second part of this verse. It says, But Jesus stooped down with His finger and wrote on the ground. That statement right there, we're going to spend a little bit of time on today. Because it is a golden nugget of information 
about exactly who Jesus Christ is. If you were to ask a group of believers if they knew what Jesus was writing on the ground at this time, you would probably hear multiple explanations of what he was writing on the ground. One of the more popular ones that you would hear is that he was writing down the names of those leaders standing in front of him who committed adultery with that same adulteress. Whatever you hear, whatever answer somebody spews out of their mouth, it would be pure speculation, wouldn't it? Because we are not told anywhere in this passage what Jesus was writing on the ground. It is not there. So if we have to speculate on what Jesus is writing, I am challenging you all to speculate in a different way. The Gospel of John, especially chapter 7 and 8, spends a great deal of time giving us many examples, giving us proof about the identity of Jesus Christ. The identity that He is of a divine nature. That He is the Son of God. The identity that He is God, wrapped in human flesh, walking on earth. When you read here in John's Gospel about someone who is writing with their finger, does that ring a bell inside of anybody's head? Does that, does that make you do what I did? Kind of tilt your head and look and go, what? Where have I heard this before? Wait a minute, what? Something's ringing a bell here. If you are well versed in the Tanakh, even the Torah, the Old Testament, friends, you might be thinking of something in Exodus and the Law of Moses. You might be thinking of the Ten Commandments. How were the Ten Commandments given to Moses? On stone tablets, right? We all know this. Let me read something that's going to blow your mind. Exodus 31, 18. When he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony. We know what that is, right? Tablets of stone written by the finger of God. Jesus Christ writing on the ground with his finger was not to identify to anyone standing in front of him who they were. It was to identify himself exactly who he was to all the people. He was sharing his identity with everyone. These leaders, the ones who were trying to entrap him and discredit him, they were getting schooled by Jesus Christ. All those leaders who were well versed in God's word, they knew exactly what Jesus Christ was telling them. He's telling them all. He is God among them. But these scribes and Pharisees, they just wouldn't let up, would they? We read in verse 7 that they kept asking him about the adulteress. This is when Jesus responds with that oh so familiar verse that most of you can recite. He who is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. You all know that one, don't you? Well, then look what happens right after he says that. In verse 8, again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, didn't he? You see the picture of what's going on here, friends? He wrote again with that same finger that he wrote the law that those leaders were trying to correct him with. Do you see what's going on here? He's telling them, friends, you better know who I am. You better know. Because I am God. I am here among you. And when the Christ charged those leaders that any of you without sin, go ahead and cast the first stone. What is Jesus Christ talking about here? Here's what He's talking about, friends. He is talking about the beginning of judgment. He's challenging those leaders by saying, are you really ready for judgment to begin? 
Jesus Christ is not saying to those leaders, you can't do this. You can't cast any stones. Christ is not saying, this is wrong. You can't do that. He's not saying that because it is not wrong to do this, biblically speaking. God's law says you can stone adulterers. There is no way Jesus Christ goes against his own law. No way. What Jesus is doing is he is saying to those leaders, do you really want judgment to begin? Then let the one without sin start it. Now think about it, friends. In that group of leaders, in that group of all the people, who is the one without sin? There's only one person without sin. The only one called the judge. That is Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, right? Yeah. He's the only one without sin. But here's the deal, friends. Jesus did not come to earth the first time to start judgment. The time of judgment was not at hand. That's coming later. That is coming later when He returns again. Look what happens after Jesus bends to the ground a second time to write. We read in verse 9, all the leaders, they just kind of what? Put their tail between their legs and left, didn't they? They were all gone until only Jesus and the adulterous woman remained. And when they had all gone and it was just the two of them, look at what Jesus says to her. He says, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? It is such an interesting picture, isn't it? Here we have the woman, a woman who is sinful, a woman who is far away from God, yet she is standing in front of the perfect one, the one without sin. She is standing right there with the one who was sent by God to deal with her sin. What a picture. Look at how this adulterous, sinful, as far away from God as you can be woman responds to this question from Jesus. What does she say? No one, Lord. Which Jesus responded with, I do not condemn you. Go. From now on, do not sin any longer. Do you see what's happening in this passage, friends? Can you pick up what's going on here? What does it mean when you are a sinful person standing in the very presence of God on earth and you call this person Lord? What is going on here, friends? What it means is that this sinful adulteress has received the gospel. It means that this person has realized exactly who Jesus Christ is. And she is acknowledging, she is confessing that she's accepting the Christ as her Lord. She is absolutely accepting that whatever outcome is going to happen from now on, whatever is getting ready to happen, is going to be based on His authority and no one else's. Do you notice she's not fighting Him? Do you notice that she's not arguing that she did nothing wrong? She is in absolute and total submission to the Christ. And we see exactly what the outcome of His authority is, don't we? When we read, I do not condemn you either. You do see the identity of Jesus Christ in this statement, don't you? He did not come into this world the first time to convict the world. As those leaders wanted to convict that adulteress, that's not what Jesus Christ came to do. He came to the world to redeem. This story of the adulteress is a story of redemption. It is a story of God's plan on full display. And look what else Jesus says at the end of the verse. From now on, do not go sin any longer. That's an ouch, isn't it? Don't miss this nugget, friends. Jesus is in no way, now or ever, condoning sinful behavior. He says, doesn't He? Stop sinning. He says to the woman, I have come to redeem you, to give you a way back to the Father. I'm not here to judge you today. I'm here to give you a way back to the presence of God. 
Stop sinning, says Jesus. Stop going against God. Now I mentioned when we started this morning, this passage is for all people. That means it's for you and me, right? If that is true, then what is it that you're going to glean from God's Word today? What is it you're going to take out the front door? Well, it's rather apparent, isn't it? Everybody in this room is a sinner. True? Everybody in this room is a sinner. Every one of us is no better or no worse than that adulteress. Every one of us is in the same position as that woman was. Every one of us, friends, you don't want to hear it, but it's the truth, has violated God's way. We all have violated this. So we're going to be judged one day for disobeying Him. That is why we are in need of redemption. Just as that woman was in need of redemption, we are in need of redemption. We, friends, need a way back to God, don't we? We need a way back to Him. Because judgment's coming, friends. It hasn't come yet, but it's coming. And we need a Redeemer, don't we? And what Jesus Christ did for that woman, here's the gold nugget for you today, doing it for us. Jesus Christ is standing right in front of us now, offering us redemption. Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus the Messiah. He came to earth 2,000 years ago to redeem you and I of our sin. He didn't come to condemn us. He came to redeem us. And to accept His gift, all you have to do is what He shows us to do in this passage. You have to acknowledge Him as Lord. You say, yes, Lord. And then you have to do what He says. You repent. Don't sin anymore. You turn around from that nonsense out there and you run as fast as you can back to God. I used to belong to the world. And you're not any worse than I was. I know things about me that you don't. I used to think that my life was so wonderful because I like to sin, friend. I like to sin. I don't want to give up my sin. But praise God, I found something more that I needed than the sin in my life. I needed redemption because of who it was. Because I'm no better or no worse than that adulterous woman. If you do not belong to Jesus Christ, please, 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 please think about what is being offered to you. It's eternal life standing in front of the presence of God forever. That's what's being offered to you. If you decide to accept His Son as the Lord, right? And turn around from that nonsense out there. Next week, we start a new series in the book of Jude. For those of you who are visiting today, please know that you are invited back to worship with us. Today's message is in a similar format to our normal messages. We go through the Bible verse by verse so we can learn God's ways to help us lead a life that is well-pleasing to the Creator of all things. If you have any inkling to come back and visit us again, please do. Please know you are most welcome. We really would love to get to know you and worship the Creator of all things with you. No doubt about it. We have food waiting for us. So please stay in fellowship. Until next week, amen. Let's sing it out with one last song and then we'll adjourn for lunch, okay? Or stay in England, all right? Did you make potato salad, Joe? I was going to say, Joe makes good potato salad, so. And stay away from the deviled eggs, please. <laughs> I don't know what God has given you to take out the doors, but I know what He's given me. <laughs> so please, folks, when we leave today, whenever we leave, let us shine the light, right? Amen. Let us shine the light of our Christ, for He is God on earth. With that being said, let me close it out. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word today. Thank You for Your Word, Father. Thank You for surrounding us with Your arms, squeezing on us, hugging on us, and loving on us, Father. Thank You for helping us let it soak in so that when we leave here today, we honor You with, with just a joy 
with an oomph in our step, Father, knowing that you have redeemed us. And please, Father, pray for these people in this room here as they go out in the week and deal with that mess out there, that they are just staying in your word and they're staying true to you, Father. It's the only way that's going to help them get through the week. It's in your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.